SpaceX is gearing up for the first Falcon Heavy launch since 2019. The Falcon Heavy mission, dubbed USSF-44, is the next launch on deck for Pad 39A at Kennedy Space Center, currently scheduled for November 1. The mission will launch a pair of classified satellites and a microsatellite for the U.S. Space Force into a 35,600-kilometer geosynchronous orbit. SpaceX has already completed the static fire testing of the USS F-44 Falcon Heavy rocket at Pad 39A. The payload fairing of the rocket, with satellites encapsulated inside it, headed to Pad 39A less than four hours after the static fire test. The payload fairing will be integrated horizontally into the vehicle in the coming days. The vehicle will then be lifted vertically for launch. A Falcon Heavy is basically three Falcon 9 boosters strapped together for three times the thrust. The payload carrying second stage is placed atop the central booster. At liftoff, the rocket's 27 Merlin engines will produce a combined thrust of about 22.8 MN. USS F-44 will be the fourth overall and first classified flight of the Falcon Heavy, which debuted in February 2018. Only the two side boosters on USS F-44 will return to Earth for safe touchdowns. The middle booster will be expended in the Atlantic Ocean, rather than attempting a landing on a drone ship. While Falcon Heavy is less powerful than NASA's long-delayed Artemis 1 Space Launch System rocket and the Starship Launch System, it's currently the most powerful operational rocket in the world. With the ability to lift nearly 64 metric tons into low Earth orbit, Falcon Heavy can lift more than twice the payload of the next closest operational vehicle, United Launch Alliance's Delta IV Heavy. Elon Musk has added Twitter to his business empire after months of legal skirmishes. In April, Twitter accepted Musk's proposal to buy the social media service and take it private. Musk quickly cast doubt on his willingness to uphold the deal, claiming that the business had not fully disclosed the quantity of spam and phony accounts using the site. Twitter sued Musk when he announced he was ending the agreement. Musk had until October 28 to complete his $44 billion purchase of Twitter, failing which the firm threatened legal action. Musk sealed the deal on Thursday night, taking Twitter private and ousting a number of top executives, including CEO Parag Agrawal. Now, with Musk in control of the company, questions continue to fly about what he will change. Musk posted a statement on Twitter on Thursday, outlining his motivations for wanting to purchase the social media network. He wrote that the reason he acquired Twitter is that it is important to the future of civilization to have a common digital town square where a wide range of beliefs can be debated in a healthy manner without resorting to violence. He added that he doesn't want it to become a free-for-all hellscape where anything can be said with no consequences. Musk is expected to share more about his plan for Twitter in the coming days. The London-based satellite company, OneWeb, has resumed deployment of its global broadband internet system constellation, with the launch of 36 satellites aboard India's GSLV Mark III rocket. The mission, which marked the first commercial launch for the GSLV, lifted off from the Satish Dhawan Space Center on Sunday, October 23. To reach its planned near-polar orbit, the rocket flew a dogleg trajectory, ensuring it would not drop debris over Sri Lanka. One of the satellites separated from the rocket at T plus 19 minutes and 45 seconds and were dispensed in five phases over a period of one hour and 15 minutes. The satellites were deployed at an altitude of 605 kilometers, with an inclination of 87.4 degrees. In the coming weeks, the satellites will use their onboard electric propulsion systems to raise themselves into their operational 1,200-kilometer orbits, expanding the OneWeb constellation to 462 satellites. OneWeb already offers high-speed broadband connections to beta customers above 50 degrees north and south. Once complete, OneWeb's satellite internet constellation will consist of 648 spacecraft, designed to provide internet connectivity worldwide by the end of 2023. The GSLV Mark III launch was OneWeb's 14th mission, which had previously been using Russia's Soyuz rocket to launch its satellites. However, the ongoing Russian invasion of Ukraine splintered that spaceflight partnership, forcing OneWeb to look elsewhere for rocket rides. OneWeb said earlier this year that it was partnering with SpaceX and ISRO to launch satellites, but the terms of these deals have not yet been disclosed. The launch vehicle that sent the latest batch of OneWeb satellites into orbit, GSLV Mark III, also known as Launch Vehicle Mark III, is the most powerful rocket ever developed by the Indian Space Research Organization. The 43.5 meters tall three-stage rocket is capable of delivering 8,000 kilograms of payload to low Earth orbit and 4,000 kilograms to the more distant geostationary transfer orbit. The rocket's first stage consists of two solid rocket boosters, fastened to either side of a liquid-fueled core, which serves as the vehicle's second stage. A single-engine cryogenic propellant stage, powered by liquid oxygen and hydrogen, makes up the third stage of the vehicle. 
The October 23rd mission was the fifth flight of the GSLV Mark III rocket and ISRO's fourth mission of the year. The Indian Space Agency is preparing to launch five more missions in the next five months. The International Space Station recently took evasive action to dodge a fragment of a satellite destroyed in a Russian anti-satellite test. On October 24, the ISS team fired the thrusters on the Russian Progress MS-20 cargo ship docked at the station for five minutes and five seconds to avoid the debris fragment. The maneuver raised the ISS's altitude by 320 meters at apogee and 1.3 kilometers at perigee. The debris fragment that prompted the avoidance maneuver was created by a November 2021 Russian test of a direct ascent anti-satellite missile. The missile, launched from the ground, destroyed a defunct Soviet satellite known as Cosmos 1408, creating over 1,500 pieces of trackable orbital debris. According to NASA, without Monday's maneuver, the fragment could have passed within about 5 kilometers of the station. An uncrewed Russian Progress MS-21 spacecraft arrived at the International Space Station on October 28. Russia launched the Progress supply freighter on October 26 atop a Soyuz 2.1A rocket from Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. The spacecraft carried 2,520 kilograms of cargo, fuel, water, and other supplies for the crew members aboard the orbiting laboratory. Two days after its launch, the Progress MS-21 spacecraft autonomously docked to the space-facing port of the station's Poisk module and began its 196-day-long mission. Two days before the Progress MS-21 launch, Russia's Progress MS-19 spacecraft, which delivered supplies and fuel to the station in February, undocked from the station's Poisk module and fired thrusters for a deorbit burn to fall back into the Earth's atmosphere. Loaded with trash and other unnecessary equipment, the Progress MS-19 spacecraft largely burned up during re-entry, scattering some of its debris over a remote area of the Pacific Ocean. Progress is one of three robotic spacecraft that currently fly cargo missions to the station, the other two are SpaceX's Dragon capsule and Northrop Grumman's Cygnus vehicle. A Cygnus mission, dubbed NG-18, is currently targeting liftoff on an Antares rocket no earlier than November 6 from NASA's Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport in Virginia. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. SpaceX got one step closer to the first orbital test flight of its Starship launch system, with a series of successful full-stack cryoproof tests. The Starship 24 Super Heavy Booster 7 full-stack cryoproof test campaign began on October 24. On Monday evening, SpaceX pumped liquid nitrogen at cryogenic temperatures into the liquid oxygen propellant tanks of Ship 24 and Booster 7. Booster 7's oxygen tank was filled to 75% of its total capacity, and Ship 24's oxygen tank was filled to 25% of its total capacity. In this LabPadre rover cam footage, you can see the Starship quick disconnect mechanism in action, delivering cryogenic fluid to the ship. The successful cryoproof test, which lasted for about two and a half hours, assessed the integrated vehicle's strength at high pressure and extremely low temperatures. However, there appeared to be a problem when liquid nitrogen was drained from the ship after the test. A frost line was visible around the ship's oxygen tank on the LabPadre thermal camera, even after the cryoproof test was completed. The line was visible till Tuesday morning, indicating that it took SpaceX some time to fully empty the ship's oxygen tank following the test. The second round of full-stack cryoproof tests occurred on October 26. On Wednesday afternoon, teams pumped liquid nitrogen at cryogenic temperatures into the methane tank of Booster 7. During the hour-long test, the methane tank was filled to 20% of its total capacity with liquid nitrogen. Hours later, SpaceX conducted another methane tank cryoproof test, this time filling the tanks of both Ship 24 and Booster 7 with liquid nitrogen. The methane tank of Ship 24 had been topped up to 25% of its maximum capacity, and the methane tank of Booster 7 had been filled to 50% of its maximum capacity. The test lasted for more than 90 minutes. In a recent tweet, Elon Musk mentioned that SpaceX is still planning to launch Starship 24 and Super Heavy Booster 7 on the inaugural orbital flight test, which might happen by the end of this year or early next year. He added that the plan would change if an anomaly leading to damage to the prototypes occurred during the ongoing pre-launch tests. If that's the case, Starship 25 would be the next option for the test flight. It will lift off from Starbase by riding on top of Super Heavy Booster 8 or Booster 9. Starship 25 is currently positioned on the suborbital launch pad A, and Booster 8 is standing next to it. SpaceX conducted the pneumatic proof test of Ship 25 on Friday morning. The main goal of the test is to pressurize the ship with ambient temperature nitrogen gas to ensure that the rocket and all its plumbing are structurally sound and working as expected.
If the pneumatic proof test is successful, the next step will be cryo-proof testing using sub-cooled liquid nitrogen. The road closure notice suggests that full stack and ship 25 tests will resume next week. While rocket testing is rapidly progressing at Starbase, Raptor engine testing is also in full swing at SpaceX's McGregor test facility. Over the past several weeks, McGregor has been the site of several back-to-back -back Raptor engine rapid relight tests. The Raptor relight tests involve firing the engine for several seconds on a test stand before a brief pause, followed by an engine relight. These kinds of tests make sure that the engines are capable of refiring after completely shutting down. Super Heavy and Starship engines need to have the capability of completely shutting down and reigniting rapidly on different instances of flight. In the case of Super Heavy boosters, engine relight is required during boost back after stage separation, during atmospheric re-entry, and right before landing on the launch tower arms. In the case of Starships, engine relight is performed during orbitizing maneuvers, translunar and trans-Mars injections, trajectory correction maneuvers, and landing on the surface of the Earth, Moon, and Mars. A SpaceX employee recently raised concerns about safety while working at Starbase. According to a recent report from the information, during the full-stack test in mid-October, Starship 24 experienced a gas vent, which caused the vehicle's pressure to drop suddenly. If the pressure of the ship had dropped below the atmospheric pressure outside, the prototype would have crumpled in on itself, leading to the launch vehicle's collapse. According to the employee who spoke to the information, about two dozen SpaceX crew members were present at the pad when this pressure drop occurred, and Starship was filled with liquid oxygen, which went against SpaceX's own safety procedures. Fortunately, there was no catastrophic failure that day, and I hope SpaceX will proceed carefully with Starship tests hereafter. Orbital launch mount upgrade works are ongoing at Starbase launch site. Recently teams began covering the legs of the launch mount with blast and thermal protection shielding. The shields will protect the conduits that supply propellants, water, and electrical connections to the launch mount from the booster Raptor engine's exhaust plume. At Starbase build site on Thursday night, teams stacked the methane and oxygen tank sections of Super Heavy Booster 9, completing the primary structure of the prototype. According to Musk, the ship and booster production line is spooling up, and each new ship and booster has incremental design improvements. For instance, Booster 9 will feature design changes to isolate and safeguard the Raptor engines if one of them explodes during a tester flight. Four Raptor engines have been delivered to Starbase recently. These are most likely to be installed on Ship 25 or Booster 9. Prefabrication of the sections for the second Starship launch tower at Kennedy Space Center is progressing at SpaceX's Roberts Road facility. Three of the nine sections are almost completely prefabricated. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.